Heroes are great, aren't they? We here at Team Triple Jump appreciate the way they save the day and do all the other hero stuff without expecting anything in return. Sometimes though, we have to admit that the villain is just a little bit cooler. You know, the antagonist has been giving you a hard time throughout the game you're playing. Wouldn't it be nice to wield their powers for once? We've discussed games that let you play as the villain before, but this time we're specifically looking at instances where said villain was off limits until the sequel. Perhaps the whole thing was planned from the beginning, with the developers fully intending the near do well in question to change their allegiances in time for a later game. Or maybe the character just appealed to fans so much that developers had to give the people what they wanted, and turn that despicable yet charismatic scoundrel into a playable protagonist, or a playable party member at the very least. Either way, we finally get to step into the shoes of someone who previously gave us a hard time, and use their once villainous qualities to further our own ends. What's not to like about that? I'm the always heroic Ashton from Triple Jump, and here are 10 video game villains you play as in the sequel. Number 10, Miles Edgeworth. Initially coming across as tremendously cocky and coldly merciless in Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney, Miles Edgeworth is one of those characters that you just love to hate. Opposing protagonist Phoenix Wright in court, Edgeworth is as insufferable as he is unflappable and an intimidating opponent in the courtroom. Dig a little deeper, however, and some truths are revealed about this lethal legal eagle. A childhood friend of Phoenix Wright, Edgeworth's life took a tragic turn when his father was murdered, with Edgeworth thinking that he was responsible. Things got even more upsetting when the real culprit was revealed to be none other than the person who took Mars in following his father's death, the villainous Manfred von Karma. This tragic past won the pitiful prosecutor a lot of fans, and his change in demeanour once the murder was solved caused these fans to sympathise even more, so it was only a matter of time before he took centre stage. This happened in Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney Trials and Tribulations, where Edgeworth has to stand in for an injured Wright. Following this playable appearance, Mr Edgeworth went on to star in a couple of spin-offs of his own, his early villainous status all but forgotten. From smug to sympathetic in just one game. Impressive. Number 9, Saravok. Saravok from Baldur's Gate has all the trappings of a great fantasy villain. Deep, booming voice, big scary suit of spiky armour, you know, all the cool stuff. The first in-game run-in with Saravok sees him mercilessly slay the protagonist's mentor, and he will proceed to enact his nefarious plans throughout the lengthy adventure. His deeds include murder, slavery, and even a spot of market tampering, and he is enacting all this villainy in a bid to become the last remaining offspring of the god of murder. The protagonist is also a progeny of said god, and that's why they're in his way. After being soundly defeated at the end of Baldur's Gate, Saravok can show up in the Baldur's Gate 2 DLC, Throne of ball. It's a bit complicated how we got there, what with him being slain in the first game and all, but to cut a long story short, his spirit managed to reach the protagonist in a pocket plane, and the player has the option to sacrifice a bit of the protagonist's soul to revive him. Suddenly you've got yourself a powerful party member, with an extremely shady past and a little bit of your soul powering him. Surely nothing could go wrong, right? Number 8, Virgil. We're continuing the troubled sibling theme now with Virgil, the estranged brother of Devil May Cry protagonist Dante, and a character who definitely gives Saravok a run for his money in the villainous offspring of supernatural beings and brother of the main protagonist's stakes. After the death of their mother, Virgil and Dante parted ways, and while Dante embraced his human side, Virgil rejected it, instead embracing his demonic half. Showing up as an antagonist throughout the series, Virgil is involved in every mainline Devil May Cry game apart from Devil May Cry 2 and is the true identity of Nello Angelo, the big bad of the original adventure. Virgil's first playable appearance comes in a special edition of Devil May Cry 3, offering fans a different playstyle to master and finally giving them a chance to step into the shoes of Dante's demon sympathising brother. He can also transform into Nello Angelo, which gives him a whole new set of moves and powers to hack and or slash with. After this playable debut, Virgil makes a habit of showing up in special editions from that point on, appearing in the special edition of both Devil May Cry 4 and 5. Honestly, what makes him think he's so exceptional, eh? Number 7, Shiva. 
As the main antagonist of the Streets of Rage series, and the head of a far-reaching and extremely powerful crime syndicate, Mr X is an example of someone who could definitely use a formidable bodyguard. I mean, he's very capable in a scrap himself, but why bother lifting a finger when he can afford a skilled martial artist to do his dirty work for him? That's where Shiva comes in. When players finally reach Mr X in Streets of Rage 2, the crime boss will give the signal and Shiva will leap into action. Immune to throws and able to break out of holds with ease, Shiva proves one of the hardest fights in the game, and many a playthrough has ended at the last hurdle thanks to his martial prowess. Despite being repeatedly battered by him, however, fans took a liking to the super cool and intimidating Shiva, and Sega took note, as the bodyguard became a playable secret character in the third game. 27 years later, and Shiva was playable once again as a DLC character in Streets of Rage 4. He also manages to be a boss in both games. Talk about pulling double duty, though maybe that's how he stayed in such great shape after nearly 30 years. Number 6, Show Minami Moto. Continuing the trend of super cool ensemble dark horses that fans took a liking to is Sho Minami Moto, perhaps the most deranged of all the villains in 2007's The World Ends With You. This Square Enix developed adventure offers unique touchscreen based gameplay and spins a tale of a mysterious Reapers game being played just outside of reality, where lives hang in the balance. Minami Moto is one of the aforementioned Reapers and directly opposes the protagonist whenever he appears on screen. Despite his antagonistic nature though, players found Minamimoto endlessly entertaining. His cool look, his tendency to speak through a megaphone, his freakish obsession with mathematics, and the adventure revealed that not only was he working against the player, but against the other Reapers too. This all combines to make him a delightfully unpredictable, charismatic madman. In 2018's Neo The World Ends With You, Minamimoto is one of many returning characters. To the surprise of everyone though, this time he joins the player's party near the start of the game. He's still obsessed with mathematics, he's still entirely unhinged, and he'll reveal nothing about his ultimate goals, but we can trust him, right? Well, not really. Just because he still opposes the Reapers doesn't necessarily mean he's got the player's best interests at heart, either. Just be on your guard, yeah? Anyway, speaking of Reapers, number 5, Legion. Hold on to your hats, gang, because we've got ourselves a wildcard entry! In Mass Effect 2, players got the chance to recruit Legion, who is one of the Geth, a race of artificial intelligences that were common enemies in the first game. Throughout the events of the original Mass Effect, it's revealed that the Geth are under the control of Sovereign, a gigantic ancient superintelligent entity known as a Reaper, who is acting as the vanguard of a swarm of cosmic horrors hell-bent on messing up the galaxy. In Mass Effect 2, it's revealed that not all Geth are sovereign corrupted bad guys, and they can actually be pretty reasonable. The Geth platform known as Legion can even be recruited to Commander Shepard's cause, and the commander can gain a fascinating insight into the workings of his former foes. But how did Legion get on this list? It wasn't even created until after Sovereign was defeated. Well, dear viewer, the Geth are part of an enormous galaxy spanning network. They share a collective memory, so what one platform experiences, they all experience. They are Legion, so in a way, Legion was right there in the first game when Shepard and Pals were blasting hordes of Geth right in their shiny faces. Number 4, Shinobu Jacobs and Henry Cooldown. We've got a two for one in this entry. Talk about great value. In the original No More Heroes, players take on the role of Travis Touchdown, a would-be assassin who attempts to fight his way back to the very top of the assassin rankings. During this less than noble quest, Travis finds himself face to face with a colorful mix of rivals who are encountered in boss fights throughout the game. Handily for this list, two of them are playable in the sequel. First up is Shinobu, a seemingly bloodthirsty assassin from the first game who returns Turns the playable character in No More Heroes 2 Desperate Struggle. Sharing Miles Edgeworth's pain of having a father who was murdered in mysterious circumstances, she initially thinks Travis was to blame, but apparently forgets all of this by game two. The second returning assassin is Henry Cooldown, who reveals that he is, in fact, Travis Touchdown's twin brother during one of their battles. I mean, I guess their surnames sound similar, at least. Strangely, though, Henry is only playable in his own dream sequence, where he finds off bizarre robot child Mimi. The question then is this, if it was all a dream, did we ever truly play as Henry at all? The answer is yes. Yes we did. Number 3, Knuckles. 
It may seem strange today, but hard-hitting pink echidna knuckles wasn't always on Sonic's side. The pugilistic porcupine made his debut in Sonic 3, and his first in-game action was to bonk Super Sonic so hard that he lost his super, and all the Chaos Emeralds too. Knuckles quickly gathered the emeralds and handed them over to Dr. Robotnik, and a game-long rivalry was born. Further encounters with Knuckles include the debuting character operating sneaky bridge traps, nefariously powering down Carnival Night Zone, and lots and lots of punching. But why is Knuckles doing all these heinous things? Well, because Robotnik told him that Sonic was coming after the Master Emerald, the treasure that Knuckles has sworn to protect. Understandably, Knuckles decided to trust the guy with the mad scientist mustache and the army of robots tagging along, as opposed to his fellow woodland creature, and the rest is history. Luckily, as evidenced by the title of the next game in the 16-bit Sonic series, the Hedgehog and the Echidna mostly managed to sort their differences out by the time Sonic and Knuckles came around. Also, through some cartridge and cartridge trickery, Knuckles became playable in Sonic 3 too. If only we could all learn to forgive as quickly as that heroic hedgehog. Number 2. Base Looking like some kind of black and gold version of Mega Man, with a flamboyant crest to make him stick out a bit more, Base was first introduced in Mega Man 7. Created by Dr. Wily specifically to be a rival to Mega Man, these two were never going to get on, and Base's brash and cocky attitude definitely doesn't help. He is fought on four separate occasions throughout Mega Man 7, and even tricks Mega Man into trusting him at one point, before trashing Dr. Light's lab and making off with all of Mega Man's upgrades. Disgusting behaviour, I'm sure you'll agree. Base would continue in his role of cocky rival with anger issues throughout Mega Man 8, and despite playable appearances in versus modes and racing spin-offs, his first playable appearance in a campaign was in the rather appropriately named Mega Man and Base. Don't go thinking he's turned over a new leaf or anything though. He's only fighting the bad guys so he can show everyone how much better he is than Mega Man by saving the day first. Honestly, this guy needs to chill out and find a different hobby. Take up yoga, or painting, or maybe even learn an instrument. Bass, maybe? And number one, King DDD. We've had some truly despicable villains on this list so far, but step aside for the most tyrannical of them all, the greedy, despotic oppressor known as King DDD. Alright, so his name isn't very intimidating, and he looks kind of cute, but in 1992's Game Boy title Kirby's Dreamland, this villain was as diabolical as they come. Not only did he and his associates steal all of Dreamland's sparkling stars, but they took all of the food too. Makes me angry just thinking about it. Angry and hungry. Following his heinous debut, King DDD begins to fall into misunderstood villain territory, with his seemingly nefarious deeds in Kirby's adventure revealed to be an effort to keep an even bigger bad guy sealed away. After gradually turning to the light side, King DDD's first playable appearance was in the mini-games of Kirby 64 The Crystal Shards. By the time the likes of Kirby's Superstar Ultra and Kirby's Return to Dreamland came around, the rotund, self-proclaimed king became playable outside of minigames, and his status as Kirby's reformed frenemy was cemented. Don't let your guard down though, Kirby. This could all be part of some decade-spanning gambit to win your trust and then suddenly swipe your food again. I've got my eye on you, King. 